Hi, welcome back to the uh, fifth section of our introduction to poetry uh, video series. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about a, an important 20th century American poet, Sylvia Plath. Um, some of you may have heard of Sylvia Plath before. She has achieved a kind of fame that's uh, rare for a poet. Um, Movies have been made about her life, uh, TV series, documentaries. Um, she is the subject of almost countless songs, pop songs, rock songs, folk songs. Someday I'm going to make a soundtrack of all the songs that reference Sylvia Plath. Um, she has become kind of a cultural icon, a feminist icon, um, a symbol for... Um, the oppression of 1950s uh, housewife living in America and England. She lived in England for a while as well. Um, I'll give you just a little bit of background on Sylvia Plath. Her life is very dramatic. Uh, in fact, part of her celebrity is, uh, I would call it even a sort of cult of personality celebrity that's grown up around Sylvia Plath. I think this is not entirely fair to her work. Uh, she is a major poet uh, just on the grounds of her work, the strengths and brilliance of her poetry. I think that discussions of her work often get um, overshadowed or at least all tangled up with discussions of her life and the tragic circumstances of her death. Sylvia Plath was born in Boston, or just outside Boston in Jamaica Plains, Massachusetts. Her father was a biology professor at Boston University. Uh, he was a German immigrant, Otto Plath. Um, Sylvia Plath was born in 1932, uh, grew up in and around Boston. Very distinguished uh, academic career, although somewhat marred by emotional troubles. Um, she uh, began writing poetry at an early age, um, as most of our poets have done. She's um, well known as kind of the key member of a group of poets from the 1950s and 1960s uh, called the Confessional Poets. Now, confessional poetry um, suggests a kind of autobiographical uh, detail as though the poet were confessing his or her own um, sins, so to speak. I mean, we think of confession as being a, a, a laying bare of one's own sins or shortcomings or, excuse me, even in impure thoughts. Uh, the confessional mode in poetry is related to that. Although I would say it's not necessarily always autobiographical. In fact, some of the Sylvia Plath poems that we look at will complicate this idea of the confessional poem being just a laying bare of the poet's soul. So um, uh, Sylvia Plath's poems are not always autobiographical. They are not always specific to the actual details of her life. Uh, the poems about her father, which are her most famous poems probably, um, are a good example of this. She writes a good deal about the death of her father. Her father actually died when she was eight years old. Very unfortunate circumstances. He misdiagnosed his own illness. Uh, he had he had diabetes and he thought he had he thought he had cancer, so he did not seek treatment. Um, apparently, his illness could have been successfully treated even at this time, even at that time, and he could have lived a much longer, healthier life. But um, Sylvia Plath resented the death of her father, and in many poems she writes about the father figure as a, uh, as a figure of abandonment. And, you know, he, the, the actual father didn't mean to die, but um, she still lost her father at such a formative age. Um, she ends up holding it against the father figure in her poems. Again, the father figure in her poems are not always literally and biographically like the father in her real life. In real life, her father was a pacifist. He fled Germany in the early 1930s, late 1920s, uh, and came to America because of the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazism and his fear for what this would mean for German culture. Uh, 
Sylvia Plath portrays the father as a as a Nazi, as a uh, as a brutalizer, as a violent man. Now we know that in real life this is not what her father was like. So she's making a dramatic uh, character out of the father. Uh, her poem, Daddy, is probably her most famous poem, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. We'll talk about a couple of other Plath poems, too. I am also going to be posting uh, some links about Plath, which I hope you'll look closely at. Um, I will also post a video of Plath herself doing a reading of that poem, Daddy. It's a very dramatic reading. Um, she reads it a little differently than I do. so. Uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to hear that, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Um, confessional poetry, uh, as I said, was a movement of the 1950s and 60s. It corresponds in some ways with beat poetry, B-E-A-T poetry. Allen Ginsberg was the most famous beat poet, also kind of a cultural celebrity. Um, amongst the confessional poets, Sylvia Plath's professor and mentor, Robert Lowell, who is also in our anthology, probably the most famous poet of the 1960s in America, um, was considered the sort of founder of the confessional movement. And her close friend, Anne Sexton, is also, those three poets are probably the most important three poets of the confessional movement. Although none of them write exclusively autobiographically. So this is a little bit of a wrinkle in what people think of as confessional poetry. I hope you'll do a little um, search on confessional poetry and and see what you think about the definitions of it and how well the poetry fits into that category. Poets tend to hate being categorized and tend to work against any sort of labeling that gets assigned to them. I think every poet probably wants to be recognized for their work and, and for the work on its own merits and not to be considered a part of a, part of an institution or a group. Um, so let's look at a couple of Sylvia Plath poems together. I would like to start with um, one of my favorite Sylvia Plath poems uh, from the middle period of her career. As you're reading through Plath's work, I hope that you'll think about the evolution in style and in voice from her early work through her middle work and into her later final work, uh, which was published posthumously. So a word about Sylvia Plath's death, because it is such a it is, it is, it's the elephant in the room when you talk about Plath. Is that she committed suicide. She was only 30 years old. It was her second, third, or fourth suicide attempt, depending on which biography uh, you consult. Um, it was in a particularly gruesome way. Um, I think that the, the circumstances surrounding that and the nature of that um, have... Uh, maybe created an exaggerated response to the final poems um, in her work. Although if you, if you were inclined to read it autobiographically, you can certainly see a, a, a movement toward a, toward a darker um, aesthetic, a darker sense of the way of the world in her later work. Um, her later work gets very spare. The lines are often very short, very, very long, thin poems. Um, it's almost like the poems are becoming emaciated. Uh, the earlier work by Plath is fairly typical of its time. It's, it's, it's formal. Um, the language is fairly ornate. The language is uh, more traditionally what we would consider the language of poetry, kind of an elevated language. Um, later work is maybe a little more spare. The language is um, stripped down. Uh, consider her poem, uh, Words, uh, very late in her career that begins with axes, the word axes. So she's starting to think of words as uh, these sort of blunt instruments, these tools for survival. So I want to look at a middle period poem by Sylvia Plath first. I'd like to look at a poem called Mirror. I'll just read this one. If you're following along in your book, this is on page 173. It's also in our Norton Anthology. Um, it's one of many Sylvia Plath poems selected 
to go into that Norton anthology. As I read this poem, think about who the speaker is. That's very important. Whose perspective are we hearing in this poem? Mirror by Sylvia Plath. I am silver and exact. I have no preconceptions. Whatever I see, I swallow immediately, just as it is, unmisted by love or dislike. I am not cruel, only truthful. The eye of a little god, four-cornered. Most of the time, I meditate on the opposite wall. It is pink with speckles. I have looked at it so long, I think it is a part of my heart. But it flickers. Faces and darkness separate us over and over. Now I am a lake. A woman bends over me, searching my reaches for what she really is. Then she turns to those liars, the candles or the moon. I see her back and reflect it faithfully. She rewards me with tears and an agitation of hands. I am important to her. She comes and goes. Each morning it is her face that replaces the darkness. In me, she has drowned a young girl. And in me, an old woman rises toward her day after day like a terrible fish. So in that, in that poem, uh, the uh, speaker is not Sylvia Plath, the poet. It's not even a person standing in for the poet. Um, she really very interestingly gives the voice of that poem to the mirror itself. And then halfway through the poem, she changes the metaphor to a lake, right? And I want you to think about what the difference is between a mirror and a lake. Now, both have reflective surfaces, right? So that's something they have in common. That's what makes this uh, metaphorical shift work. They have enough in common to carry over such that you can see your own reflection in the surface of a lake just as you can in the surface of a mirror. In fact, uh, Sylvia Plath was, was uh, very interested in Greek mythology and Roman mythology. And I, I believe that this, you'd consider this a reference to the myth of Narcissus. Um, Narcissus, a young, uh, young boy who was so in love with his own appearance um, that he would stare into the surface of, of, a, of a lake or a, or a pond uh, just looking at his own reflection. And one day he looks at it so long and gets so enraptured by his own appearance, he topples over, he falls in, and he drowns. So like most of the Greek myths, like most of the fables and stories um, from those times, there's a, meth there's a moral to that. There's a message to that, which is don't be so vain. Uh, it's a caution against vanity. It's a caution against falling in love with your own reflection. Um, or thinking so highly of yourself that you lose sight of the world around you. Um, if someone calls you a narcissist, uh, that's the reference that they're making. Uh, n narcissism and the idea of the narcissist has become uh, uh, c important in 21st century American culture. We do live in the age of the selfie, right? So that's, uh, that's just something to so, some sort of long view reference to take on this. Um, now, the the, uh, the the woman in the poem um, who is reflected by the mirror and reflected by the lake um, is having an issue with that as well. She is struggling with getting older. She is struggling with her own aging process. I believe there's another reference in this poem and I think you might have picked up on it already. If not, though, I hope that you'll think about uh, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all.
right? So this is a story most of us will know from childhood, um, the story of, the, of uh, Snow White. I believe that that's uh, uh, retelling myths and fairy tales is an important part of um, Sylvia Plath's work. Her friend and fellow confessional poet Anne Sexton did a whole series of poems retelling myths and fairy tales. Um, these are these are important cultural touchstones, and so the retelling of them, the recasting of them in in a contemporary moment uh, is very valuable for poets. You'll see a little bit later in the next segment um, how fascinated, even obsessed, the poet John Keats, who was working in the seven, uh, in, sorry, in the eighteen um, teens, eighteen twenties, was equally obsessed with. Um, Greek myths and, and uh, fairy tales. So, a couple of other things about this uh, Sylvia Plath poem, Mirror. We can think of this poem as a monologue, um, not a dialogue, only one voice is speaking. So we think of this poem as a monologue, and the mirror is making essentially a defense for itself. Um, it, it is uh, in line four, I am not cruel, only truthful. So um, what the mirror shows the woman is not intended to harm her. It's just intended to give her, you know, just the facts, right? This is how it really is. But this is not what the woman wants to see. Um, there's an Elvis Costello song called Deep Dark Truthful Mirror, which I'm pretty sure is a reference to this poem. Um, the uh, the uh, the light flickers, faces in darkness separate us. Then we get the switch to the lake. Um, searching my reaches. This goes back to the question I asked you earlier. What the, what the lake has that the mirror doesn't is depth, right? Something can be lurking under the surface of the lake, and we we don't always know what that is. We can't see that far into it. So for that final image of the terrible fish, which is rising up toward the speaker, really kind of menacing, kind of frightening image. Um, that's uh, that's why that that's why that change away from the mirror to the lake is so essential. Um, so we can bring that image in at the end. I wonder at the second, third line of that second stanza, then she turns to those liars, the candles or the moon. I wonder if you've given thought to why the candles and the moon are called liars. Um, think about the sort of romantic comedy scene where the couple goes on the first date and uh, they always take a moonlight stroll or they go out for a candlelight dinner. Right now, now why why would those be the sort of cliches for um, a first date or even a romantic date? Candles and mirrors, or I'm sorry, candles and moonlight. Uh, that's soft lighting. That's not lighting uh, that that brings a, that brings in the cruel light of day. Um, it's soft lighting. Um, you might say that we all feel like we look our best in, uh, in that sort of uh, gentle light. Um, it's also not very bright, not very harsh lighting. Um, so these are a few things about this poem that I hope you'll consider. Um, just the, um, the, the real exactitude in word choice. She's, she has a very specific uh, progression in mind for this poem. Uh, and, and the words and images are chosen with such precision to create this building effect so that when we get to the end of the poem and we see this, um, this terrible fish rising up, we are, we are prepared uh, for some dramatic ending like that. It's one of the things that Sylvia Plath does beautifully well um, to build through a poem such as that. I'd like to look just for a moment or two at her most famous poem, or one of her two or three most famous poems, and that's the one I mentioned earlier called Daddy. And Daddy is on page 222. Uh, this is a long poem, and I'm 
I am posting. Maybe you've already, maybe you at this point you will have already seen the post uh, of Sylvia Plath reading this poem herself. Um, if not, I hope that you'll watch it after we finish this segment. I'm only going to read, let's say, three stanzas of this poem. And it's mainly to give a kind of sonic effect, a kind of sound effect to the poem. Um, as I said, the, autobio the autobiographical elements of this aren't very exact. She isn't really trying to um, uh, portray her own father uh, too closely, although there are some similarities. Um, also, later in the poem, I won't read this part, but it's in the last um, oh, four stanzas where she says, uh, and then I knew what to do. I made a model of you, a man in black with a Mein Kampf look. Mein Kampf is the title of Adolf Hitler's autobiography, translated as My Battle or My Struggle in German. Um, that model that she made of the father actually is... Um, uh, the, the suggestion here would be that it's, it was her husband, the poet Ted Hughes, who was probably the most celebrated younger English poet of the 1950s. Um, he was well known uh, before Plath, not nearly so well known all these many years later, uh, some 50 years later after her death. Um, he is not nearly so well known as she, as she is. Um, he died back in the 90s, I think. I, uh, I would say that uh, you should look at the photographs on the, on the Modern American Poetry um, link that I'm going to provide. Look at the photographs of, of Hughes and of Plath's father. Um, th it is a little bit alarming how similar their facial structures are. Um, so I would like to uh, read you just a bit of this poem. Um, and I want you to think about the sound effects and how the language works. Daddy by Sylvia Plath. You do not do, you do not do any more black shoe in which I have lived like a foot for 30 years, poor and white, barely daring to breathe or at you. Daddy, I have had to kill you. You died before I had time, marble heavy, a bag full of God, ghastly statue with one gray toe, big as a Frisco seal, and a head in the freakish Atlantic, where it pours bean green over blue in the waters off beautiful Nosset. I used to pray to recover you, ah, do. Ach, du is German for just ah, uh, you. I believe at the end of that second stanza, the ghastly statue is a continuation of an image that, that you've already read and that, and that we will have already talked about by now uh, from the poem The Colossus, where um, the Colossus of Rhodes uh, is an, makes an image for Sylvia Plath's uh, attempts to recover her father. So I'm only going to read the first three stanzas of that just to give you a sense of the sound effects. I think that you might hear a sort of nursery rhyme quality to this. That ooh sound that is in you and do and shoo. Um, that's repeated 60 times in this poem. The ooh sound 60 times. So that's a really sort of hard driving effect. She's really trying to like bring home um, uh, an effect with that kind of repetition. Uh, and I think part of the effect is a sort of sing song, nursery rhyme quality, which is, uh, I don't know, you might think it's a bit twisted for a subject matter like this to try to invoke a nursery rhyme. But uh, you also have to think how many of the fairy tales and children's stories and nursery rhymes are kind of terrifying too. Um, there are many references to uh, Germany and German culture and particularly Nazi culture. Uh, Sylvia Plath 
has gotten into her reputation has suffered a bit or taken a hit at least for this um, identification she makes with the Jews of the Holocaust. Um, she was not a Jew herself. It's even it's even debatable as to whether she has any Jewish ancestry. Um, so there is a sense that maybe she's co-opting um, someone else's suffering and a further sense that how can the suffering of one one little person, one little fairly privileged person in America um, possibly relate to or or be the the uh, stand-in, the analogy for the suffering of six million and countless more who suffered from displacement and and loss of family um, in the Holocaust. So I think this is a problem. I think this is an issue with Platt's work. She does it uh, with some frequency of co-opting the, the suffering of others. Um, I don't think it diminishes the genius of the language uh, or the depth of the feeling necessarily of this poem. Um, but I think it's, imp it's, it's important to think about how poets use cultural um, moments, how poets use cultural happenings. And uh, poets live in the world, so that's what they have to write about. Um, I think maybe there's, a, there's an insensitivity here. Um, that has probably uh, made Plath a, a, an even more controversial figure. So I hope that you will um, look through the rest of uh, that poem and, and study it pretty closely. It's one of the most written about poems uh, in 20th century American poetry. Uh, I would also encourage you to look closely at Fever 103, uh, at the poem Ariel, which may be her next most famous poem. Um, there's so many layers in that poem, uh, even the, going back to the title. Um, I think there are at least three meanings for that title, so or at least three reference points for that title. I hope that you'll hope that you'll find those. Um, and also Lady Lazarus over on page 244. Um, here again we get the uh, Nazi references, the German references. Um, even uh, there are some excised lines from this poem about uh, uh, being Japanese um, over about ten stanzas in um, that she took those out um, after revising. So I think you'll find Sylvia Plath a fascinating poet. I hope that you enjoy her poems and are challenged by them, and I hope that they open your eyes to uh, a kind of suffering, a kind of a kind of articulation of uh, of of pain, and also of the beauty of the world. Uh, I think there's much more in Plath than just pain and suffering. Um, so I hope that you'll uh, look closely at these poems. She's a very important poet.